Hello, everybody. Is my mic working? Can anyone hear me? Uh, that one's on, and the other one might be on. Okay, is it working? Um, sorry. Oh, there we go. Okay, hello. Hello. All right, okay. Hi, everybody. Thanks for coming. Um, I know it's late. Um, but uh, we're here to talk about data and Planet Labs. Um, my name is Robin Kraft. This is Kyle Howell. Um, we're, we work, work at Planet Labs on the Data Lab team. Um, and so you might be wondering what Planet Labs is. Does anyone not know what Planet Labs is? OK, wait a second. I know you know. <laughs> um, so Planet Labs is a small sat company based in San Francisco um, uh, that builds tiny satellites. They're about this big. Um, and uh, uh, launches them into space and operates them um, on an imaging mission um, where we're trying to get to one day um, revisit time for the entire Earth's land surface. Um, so this is what they look like. Um, this is what they look like compared to Landsat, so just a blip on the screen really. Um, but the, the cool thing about it is that we can, really, um, we can really launch a lot of them. We launch them dozens at a time. Um, and so that's how we get the, the daily coverage um, at much lower cost than you would get otherwise. Um, we're also collecting imagery at three to five meter resolution for the imagery, uh, for the resolution geeks among us. Um, so on the data lab team, um, we are trying to show off what you can do with uh, the data that com that's coming out of the planet platform. We have great APIs. Um, there's a lot of cool imagery that you can do cool stuff with. We're releasing a ton of imagery um, for California for free, which Kyle will talk about a little bit later. Um, and uh, yeah, so with that, I want to admit something. I'm not a geographer, I'm an economist by trade. Um, and I feel like uh, as, as someone who has stepped into this, um, into this world sort of accidentally, that there's a little bit of tension about how the, the two worlds deal with data. So in economics, time is a huge component of everything we do. So we want to look at how GDP is changing over time, how tax rates are changing over time. Stock market fluctuates at the millisecond level. Um, in geography, well, and then on the geography, Ge the geographic side of, of economics, um, we basically are at the level of, okay, this state is next to another one, this country is a neighbor of another one, it's landlocked, yes or no. Um, so it's very um, barbaric when it comes to the geographic aspect of economics, uh, economic analysis. On the other hand, um, there's geography, which has incredibly rich spatial data, as we all know and love, that's why we're here. Um, although as an economist, I have to say, time really sucks in, uh, in geography. And that uh, is kind of a shame because a lot of really interesting stuff happens um, at the, um, in space over time periods. Um, and it seems like there's always this trade-off of time versus space. Um, there aren't great tools in the geographic world for handling time. Um, there are some that are getting better. Um, CartridgeDB with Torque, really good one, for example. There's others out there. Um, but uh, even in the, in the remote sensing world, there always seems to be this trade-off between temporal resolution and spatial resolution. And there, that's a real trade-off, and it's there for physics. Nobody's going to argue with that. Um, but uh, you know, the, the problem is that you know, stuff happens in space and time, so it's kind of a shame not to have more of a temporal component. Um, for example, deforestation, which is something I've studied a lot, is inherently economic. It's an investment in real estate, essentially, um, or agriculture, or both. Um, but it moves fast, um, so there's space and time again. And interestingly, just a fun fact, it actually fr fragments under satellite scrutiny. So in Brazil, where they've had a really good monitoring program for decades, um, satellite-based monitoring program, you see more and more deforestation happening at subpixel level, um, uh, so that because people know that they will get picked up um, uh, if they uh, more quickly if they deforest over large areas. Um, so what was exciting to me about Planet Labs data is that it approaches the frequency of the economy. So granted, it's not millisecond frequency. I'll give you that. Um, but going from every couple of weeks to every or every couple of months to daily um, data for any land cover in the world is pretty awesome. Um, and as an economist, sort of, I never got a PhD, um, I'm super excited about that, and I think that there's a lot of cool stuff that can be done um, with this data. Um, so this is a nice shot from last week of some town in Canada. Um, it's five, uh, three to five meter resolution um, images shot in the same week. Um, and yeah, not tons, is change, cha tons of stuff is changing, but you can really see the, um, agriculture happening um, on a daily basis as different t f fields are tilled um, and uh, you know, I guess somebody's 
tilling a lot of fields um, <laughs> last week. Um, but it's interesting that you can see that. Um, and there's probably some interesting analysis that, that could be done um, based on like patterns of, uh, patterns of um, preparing soil and future productivity and timing. Anyway, that's out of my scope. But um, the point of this is um, to say that doing a lot with time and space um, requires some creative thinking in the geography world. Um, it's an opportunity to um, really move beyond a, uh, you know, kind of just poor temporal data um, and um, look at the, get a little bit better about um, modeling the world as it actually is. Um, the other thing to keep in mind, though, is that um, data management will become more of an issue as you have more and more data, obviously. And so at Planet Labs, we're trying to, we're releasing a lot of data for free so that we can get people's creative juices flowing um, about how to deal with this temporally, um, temporally very detailed data. Um, and we're also trying to do some interesting things with data management so that you don't have to download all the data just to look at it. So with that, I'm gonna pass you over to Kyle. Right. Um, so I'm excited to talk to you guys about Open California. Um, here at Planet Labs, we're huge consumers of open source tools and frameworks, but we haven't given much back to the community um, until now. Uh, we're releasing our entire imagery archive um, over California. Um, and on the platform, um, you can access not only our images, um, but images from the Rapid Eye constellation of satellites from, from Blackbridge, as well as the latest Landsat data. Um, and I'm gonna go through a couple examples of how to access that data using our JavaScript client and our Python client, um, as well as show you some of the things I've built that I think are pretty cool and some of the things um, that other developers have built on top of our data set. Um, so let's jump right into it. Um, so to access our Python client, it's pip install planet. Um, this is an example of how to, um, how to access some of that data. Um, I'll just quickly go through this code here. Um, we're using the API module from the, the planet package. This is the AOI I just um, drew over downtown Raleigh. Uh, we're gonna download these to my desktop. Um, you will have to set an environment variable, uh, PL API key. And then um, accessing the scenes are as simple as client.get scenes list. And we'll do this three times to get the three most recent images um, we have in Raleigh, and we'll just I'll quickly show you those here. Uh, th these are just thumbnails, but um, that's basically how easy it is to use our, our Python client. Um, and now I want to show you. Whoops. Come on. There we go. Um, and this is, this is a tool I'm very proud of. Um, this is our comparison lab. You can access it on our platform. Um, and as you, as you know, in California, we've had um, pretty severe drought this summer. Um, and this is um, from Lake Oroville. Um, we're looking at two images from um, the, the end of October 2015 and the end of um, February of this year. And you can just see just the drastic change in water level. Um, this is just an example of of the kind of, um, the kind of change you can highlight at three to five meters. I know it's, it's sometimes tough with, with um, a medium resolution to capture what you want, but um, pretty compelling example of, of how the earth is changing. Um, this is another example here. This is off, um, off Key West, Florida. You can see some of the, sh the shore changes uh, between um, November 9th and December 14th here. Um, and here we have seaweed farms in China um, harvested over the period of a month. And, and all, this was built using our JavaScript client. Um, and I want to quickly walk you through some of the code. Um, so part of this application, um, I'm, I'm doing a search for all scenes that are in this map extent. Um, and this is the code for that here. We're basically constructing a query object, and this is exactly the same as it is in Python or JavaScript. Um, the type would be ortho here. Um, and we're ba I'm basically asking for, give me the 1,000 most recent images um, in my um, area of interest, uh, which we're pulling from the map here. 
Um, and I'll put myself at the mercy of the Wi-Fi and try to step through this code. Come on. There we go. So I'll quickly show you the, the query object that we're constructing here. Um, again, the type is ortho. You can also search for Landsat. Um, and we're running an inter intersection query against uh, this GeoJSON formatted object. And GeoJSON is a pretty standard um, type of data that we use um, to interact with all of our APIs. And if we step through here to the next. And we can see what, what the API is returning us here. Uh, we have, these are all the overlapping scenes um, in our area. And let's just take a look at the first one here. And this is the type of object you'll get back from our API. Um, metadata about each, about each scene, and also links to the um, geotiff so you can display right in the browser. Um, and next, I want to show you some, this is what I've built, but I'm really proud of the developer community around our, our free data. Um, and I'll show you some cool examples of, of other things people have built. This is just released last week. This is, I might m mess up his name, Christopher Helm um, built this. It's a, a ship counter analyzing um, ships leaving um, docks um, in California. Just another example of what you, what you can, an can analyze at, at three to five meters. And this one is particularly cool. Most of our images look like this, by the way. Just over half the images we downlink are of clouds and, and not very useful. But um, this is from Bad Newberg. He developed a um, sort of a cloud, cloud detection um, trained um, neural net. Um, yeah, very cool stuff there. And I'll quickly show off Ian's tool hiding in the back there. But this is uh, agriculture is another. Um, example of a great example of our showing off our data and I'll just step through the time series here you can see the date in the bottom um, but just just another way to display our data um, on the web here and I didn't want to take I wanted to leave some time for questions Robin um, how are we doing on time uh, two minutes great um, are there any questions from anyone